Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> All right, this is Matt Polkamp here with Pete and Pete on the Break It Down podcast show. And now, the Break It Down show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Perfect. Hey, Matt. Boom. Pete Koch here. And, you know, you and I met some years ago, and I'll take credit for sort of instigating the conversation, I think, as I recall, at Gold's Gym. And I said, man, this guy looks like an athlete. I got I to gotta ask him what his game is, you know. Mm-hmm. And you told me, I thought it could have been anything from, you know, beach volleyball to tennis. I, my, my brain kind of works that way. I look at people and imagine what they, they might do with themselves athletically. And you uh, put the wild card on me, I think. Yeah. And you said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a professional athlete. I ride a bicycle. Yeah. Tell me, tell the audience a little bit about uh, how you got started riding a bike and uh, how that became a profession. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's a pretty common thing when I tell people, you know, what I do. I say, you know, I race bicycles. Or if I say I race bikes, they usually think, oh, motorcycles. It's like, no, bicycles. So I always say bicycles. They're like, so like Lance Armstrong stuff, like Tour de France. I was like, no, I race a BMX bike. And they're like, really? Aren't you kind of big for that? You know, because I am one of the taller guys. Um, but yeah, I started racing BMX when I was, geez, 10 years old. I saw it on Nickelodeon, fell in love with it, found out where the local track was. Had my parents uh, come with me to go check it out. And I know that this is in Cincinnati. That's where you Yeah, Cincinnati, up. Ohio. Uh-huh. Yeah, so I saw it. I watched it in person, fell in love with it, and uh, haven't stopped. That's it. You just That's passion. It. And what about the other stuff that, you know, a lot of 10-year-olds are into, ball sports? Was that your thing, or did you kind of forego that and focus on, on the bike? No, I, I played it all. I mean, I played. I was, I, I was grateful and, you know, for my parents to give me a taste of everything. So, I, I mean, I played baseball. I played football. I played... Um, soccer, you know, I played it all. I swam. Actually, I swam, started swimming from age five all the way to senior in high school, which was kind of, I thought, my path because that's my brothers and sisters went with that through college. But yeah, I tried it all and then I, I got a taste of BMX racing and I, I never looked back. I mean, it was, nobody knew what it was, but I fell in love with it. And um, again, you know, here many, many moons later, I'm still doing it. When you get on that path, I mean, you're, you're, siblings swim and that means that you guys probably all have big motors you can just and you have to have a big motor to do bmx but also like the balance and everything else that comes with that when did you start to understand that you know like okay i can throw the ball fine and i hit it okay and i can tackle but but this balance and i don't you know i I never thought about it i just as a kid as a 10 year old you're like wow you see something and it's like that looks cool i want to do that and you just go and do it and when you're that young your body you just you're like a sponge you absorb everything But I did, you know, once I hit my growth spurt, you know, my early teens, that's when things got really crazy because your body's changing so quickly. And uh, that's when I really noticed kind of a a downward spiral in my, um, you know, my balance and coordination, which I think is common for anything. Um, But when you're a kid, you just don't think about it. You're like, I want to do it. I don't care how good I am, how bad I am. I just want to do it, you know, and that's what I did. What's that jump to being a professional like when does it how does that transition work in the sport of bmx bike to go from hey just i'm a kid just entering a race and just going like charging as hard as i can to win a trophy and when does that when do you start to think man i can i can uh, do this professionally how does that how does that happen uh it's, it's kind of a gradual thing because i did have a lot of success um as an amateur and like on a national circuit you know first you start locally then you start you go state and then regionally and then nationally so i climbed my way up to the national series as an amateur turn some heads nationally with that and then you get sponsors and things like that come in and help you out help you get to the races and things like that but i mean i I went to college and so i never thought you know I, i planned on getting a business degree and going into business finding out that i could make a living racing bmx wasn't on my radar until it was just kind of like offered to me basically and the sponsor is a part of it bike yeah sponsor. yeah sponsors um you know you have outside the industry sponsors here and there and then uh in the industry sponsors bike bicycle brands 
equipment companies and so on. And did you, so were you going to college and, and racing professionally at the same time? Yeah. That must have been an uh, interesting schedule it was. challenge. It was. It was really difficult because I had to miss class to travel to, you know, across the country, across the world for an event, you know, which is kind of interesting because all my, my peers were, you know, living, they were there for school, partying and going to school and, and that's it. Where on the weekends I was taken off catching a flight to, you know, Los Angeles from Ohio or, or Miami, wherever, you know. And the, or, and the racing takes place in Europe also. Is that a separate circuit or is that just part um, of the... These days, yeah, they have a European circuit as well, but the U.S. is where it's at. Basically, everybody in the world comes to the U.S. to compete because this is where all the most of the sponsorships and exposure are. When did you realize that you could really make... I mean, obviously, when you're young and it's fun, you just keep doing it. But at some point, like, I want to have money. I want to buy a car, maybe a house. So when do you realize, holy shit, I really can actually make money doing this? Like, adult money. Yeah, I think I was, like, 19. I was okay. 19 years old. I got offered a contract with Schwinn, okay. which was a huge company. I mean, they've been around forever. I couldn't believe it. Like, I showed my dad. He was like, what? He, he couldn't believe it either. Yeah. You know, I mean, it wasn't a whole lot of money. I mean, it was for a 19-year-old kid, 19-, sure. 20-year-old kid. Sure. And then it turned into, you know, I was still living at home yeah. um, because I was traveling so much. I was based out of home. I was never home. Um, and then it just got to a point where I was making more money than my, my parents were still living at home. And, uh, you know, then eventually, you know, bought a house and all that. It just, it's one of those things where I didn't focus on that in the beginning, making money because I just loved the sport. I loved riding and it wasn't about the money. And then that just kind of came, which I think is the right way. It came organically out of the passion sure. I have for the sport acting right where does this transition begin and take us through the 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 mindset um and and by the way I, i'm gonna kind of jump ahead but was and is being a professional bmx rider is that been able to help you uh to more you know sort of comfortably navigate the ups and downs uh and, and of of becoming an actor getting to hollywood so how did all that you know, sort of come into play for you? Um, yeah, I mean, the whole acting thing, if you were to ask me, you know, I started when I was probably, you know, early 30s, and I had never, ever considered it, thought about it. It was the last thing on my mind. I mean, getting up in front of people and speaking and yeah. public speaking was number one on my list. You know, death was second, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, like a lot yeah. of people say. But basically, the way I got into it was um, with racing, and Pete, you could probably relate to this, but... It was, it was everything. It was 24-7. It was the amount, you know, how much I slept, what I ate, everything, to my training, just I had to be dialed. And it got to a point where my life was just so out of balance, you know? And somebody recommended that I do something non-physical, kind of like therapy almost, just to kind of balance my life out. And they said an acting class. I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny. That's real funny. Long story short, they talked me into going. I went to one and I got up for the first time in front of the class and did the, you know, did the scene, quote unquote, and didn't, you know, piss in my pants, right. which was a success for me. Win! And then I, I just kind of, uh, I just kept going and I started enjoying it. It was like therapy at first. And then, uh, you know, I just really started to develop a passion for it. Where were you living at that time? Cincinnati, Ohio. An acting class based there. in Cincy. Yeah. yeah. And it, I, I, can, I, I don't know. I'm uh, interested to know that. Is, is that more like a theater community approach to acting? Um, what I, my, the classes that I took were, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't know what I was getting into, but I, I, it was more of a, kind of a mix, I guess. It was more of a theater, theater yeah. type thing. But these days, I mean, they're shooting so many movies in Cincinnati. I think really? Frank Grillo just has a movie coming out called Point Blank or something like that that was shot in Cincinnati. And it seems like they're shooting a lot there. Which is really cool. Yeah. You know, like that. Might have been a little ahead of the curve. I know. Uh, I know. I when wish you were I, acting I wanna, in the Yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to book one of those and, you know, kill two birds with one stone, shoot yeah. a movie there yeah. and uh, visit yeah. the family. And I don't know, maybe it's... Eat it, five ways every night, you know? Get all yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Since, uh, yeah, yeah. Skyline Chili. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Graders Sideline, ice cream. Oh, Sideline man. Chili. Well, yeah, Pete, you spent some time I, in Cincinnati as well. I spent a little time in Cincinnati with the Bengals, but uh, mm. what's the, uh, yeah. the little hot dog and the chili goes on top and the... Skyline Cheese That's, County. Is that is that Skyline? Yeah, yeah. And then you have Gold Star, which is kind of um, you know similar. Yeah, it's like uh, the competitor, right? Like yeah, you yeah, like yeah. One or the other. Yeah. It's the uh, it's the step brother, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you go to acting class, and 
you don't piss your pants and all that's great but i mean at some point you you know something clicks you yeah know, you're in there and the guy's like give me anger and you're like all right he's gonna be like, oh, i'm mad you know like I'll yeah do that. um well i again i mean it took a long time for me to like be comfortable and just reveal you know be emotional and, and what or, you know tell the truth of what you know what's going on and relating to to the scene or the character what's going on like you know are you in there doing <laughs> scenes from a cat on a hot tin roof or yeah. something you know and you're like i'll i'll be paul newman and yeah it starts to click for you you know it's like going over whoopies or yeah i i, I think you yeah there, i mean as far as there is a some parallels with with racing and riding bmx all right along with acting again on paper it looks very different but in reality i think there's a lot of parallels um it's about being, you know, being in the flow, you know, finding the flow of it, um, being instinctual sure. to a degree um, and just in the moment. You know, it's, these are all very cliche, but it, it's true. You know, being in the moment with stuff and not not overthinking things, pre- being prepared and then just letting it rip, you know. So I think uh, there's definitely some similarities with that aspect of the two, which which is fun finding. Um, cause you have a lot of athletes that, you know, get into acting and I, and I think it's, it's good. You know, it's a, it's a good crossover and it's, uh, um, for me, it was a good transition because a lot of people, you know, like if they're professional athletes and that's their career, they don't know what to do when that ends because you, you definitely have a shelf life as a professional athlete. And for me, it was a smooth transition into acting to where I found another passion I want to just go back and pick up a thread that you mentioned when you said part of the your process of of learning to become the accomplished actor that you are is it's a bit of staying out of your own way or getting out of your I think to use your word is not overthink it and I think Clint Eastwood kind of famously has has said over the years that uh, when asked about how he sort of arrives at his performance level that uh, I don't overthink it like he is steadfastly uh, I've heard him state that I'm kind of been lucky from the beginning because I've never overthought a performance and he's exa- exactly what he he holds on to I don't, I don't know because he you know he was sort of formally trained through the studio system going back to the late 50s early 60s right and he's a very fine actor and we know that and i think to your point and i'll let you respond is is how do you not overthink something that it by all accounts it's a cerebral business you're reading and 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 portraying you know black words on white paper and making that real how do you do that without overthinking it um it's a challenge i mean i I'm, i don't say that i don't overthink things sometimes but i i do know that in my bmx racing that when i did overthink things it usually didn't end well mm. ended in a crash or a bad result or something mm. like that so i mean constantly you know i have because it is more cerebral acting is where racing you prepare and you just you just go but with acting, you know, there is, you know, like you said, it is cerebral and there is, you have more time. You want to be instinctual, but you, it's not, it's not quite the same. So I catch myself doing that and it's good that I'm aware of it. But um, I don't know. I think it's just, it never ends. You know, you got to constantly stay on top of it. And, you know, it's a constant, you know, work. It's constant work. I like that expression. Uh, the first step in solving a problem is knowing you have a problem. And, and I think so I think you you're something that I'm gleaning from what you're saying is when you're you, you're aware of when you get in your own way as an, uh, in your performance and now you've been able after years of training and years of acting you can check that right maybe hopefully earlier rather than later in, yeah. in, in your rehearsal of course and check that and go on and and find the I don't want to put words in your out in your mouth but I in uh, find the truth yeah yeah, so I, I definitely think that, you know, not overthinking in, in anything, really. And I mean, in relationships, and that's something that I struggle with, too, in, in relationships is I tend to think too far ahead. I'm overthinking things. I'm not being present, which is what, you know, what you do in athletics and you want to be doing in, in performing as well. Um, and that's something that, you know, I, I'm aware of. And I, I know that that's an issue and I, 
acknowledge it when it's happening, and I try and do what I can to to get through it. I don't know if that answered your question. I like no, no, I like it. It's and, no. it, and, and being in the moment, right? I think yeah. it's something I try to do. Boy, that's easier said than done. And uh, but you know, one thing I'll just draw on is folks that have you know heard me talk before. I've been blessed over the years for a decade. I've worked with Benicio del Toro, and in the capacity of I'm his trainer. I'm his. I'm his, I'm in charge of his health. You know, yeah. his personal trainer. But as anybody sort of understands in, in that sort of a relationship, yeah, you're, hey, you're having conversation. You're not just there's that downtime in between your your sets and exercises. And one thing that he's impressed upon me in the times that we've 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 uh, approached the the topic of his acting and performance is um, he's very keen to finding anything that's anything less than completely truthful, and that includes. Not just the not just the words. So he he's very big on rewriting the words to make sure that they so that what his character is saying is truthful. But it's also the actions and the circumstances. So the dialogue might be fine, but he could find himself in a position, for example, well the gun is here, the bad guy is over there, and he's standing behind the wall, and it says it's not really it doesn't really make any sense that it would all line up that way. So he. Gets with the director beforehand, and, the, and the, sometimes the, the director of photography, and they, they go about it and go about the process of fixing that, yeah. uh, so that and you say, well, but the but the dialogue is truthful, and he's like, yeah, but I can't be completely truthful from walking, and the blocking is such that it's not, I'm, it's dishonest, and and I got to get that straight before the camera rolls. Yeah, yeah, so committed on every single dimension of what's happening that's for, beautiful he man. demands it that's beautiful yeah and, and, i mean and it shows <laughs> he's, a, he's a he's a beast yeah yeah he's one of my favorite actors man he's yeah he's he's a beast you were talking about your transition from racing to acting and how you wanted something that would create more balance it seemed like in your life because you were so regimented and also like just some therapy of sorts right so how has that worked with the acting? I mean, you still, I imagine, are going to segment like how you flex your acting muscle. You know, like, do you get too regimented in that? Like, today I'm going to work on this. And... It's funny because, and here's another thing of me being aware of myself yeah. and my behaviors and my habits and my history, my patterns, is that I feel like I'm going the other direction with it, you know, oh, to where... To where the reason I brought acting into my BMX, it's kind of flip flop now. Uh -huh. So lately, I've been uh, trying to get on my bike more oh. and use that to get away from the acting a little bit. And it's really interesting how that works, how it's cyclical like that, you know, how that works. And I found out, like, I went riding. There's a skate park right down the road by my place for the first. It's, I've been at that place for five years, and it's the first time I've ridden it in five years. And it's going to be a twice a week thing now because I just felt so good branch you know getting away from the acting for a couple yeah. hours so it's funny how that flip-flopped yeah. you know so now i'm using the bmx as ther the bmx riding as therapy from the acting whereas how i got into acting was you know so the skate versa. park i know the one you're talking about the it's, cove it's on yeah. olympic yeah yeah, yeah. so oh so you you're so you skateboard too no 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 i, I ride my bmx bike it, oh in the park, yeah, they have a bike night on on oh. Monday evenings from five to ten p.m. and then Thursdays. Oh, that's really from five rad. to ten p.m. Wow, so I got so in there. You could do that too. I yeah, got it. and it's oh, right. See. It's yeah, it's it's three blocks from my place, and I felt like a little. I was like, oh my gosh, I feel reborn. This is you know, I felt like I was ten years old again, and it's it's crazy because you you know you get complacent with it, and it's like, but it was it was just so it was so great. I watch, uh, I'm sort of barely connected to Steve Cowell. One of my friends is a very good friend of his. And so every now and then I'll end up at the same place as them. And Steve still skates. And he's, I mean, he's got to be 54 years old, right? But he doesn't skate like a young person. His skating is so smooth. It's just, whatever the most efficient way to skate is, like if you were to map that around a pool, he's the one that's doing the mapping. Yeah. It's incredible. So he's not worried about amplitude and all that. He's, so is that kind of what you're doing? Exactly. Oh, okay. Exactly. Because, nice. you know, uh, you know, I'm in my early 40s now and, you know, going out there and trying to do tricks or ride too hard. I mean, the ground, the ground definitely gets harder. <laughs> <laughs> the older, maybe I get more brittle. Yeah. I don't know. I think the ground gets harder. But I, I, in my opinion, just going around and just flowing, flowing, yeah. 
fast and smooth. You know, it's like art, man. It's like you're out there creating something, you know, something and you might catch it on video. You might not, but you, you create it and you just feel it. You feel that flow. And um, I'd rather watch that than guys getting 10 feet in the air doing flips and stuff like that. I would rather see somebody just carving through a dirt berm or, uh, you know, a bowl on a, in a skate park. That's just like freaking poetry. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, so that, that's where I'm at. You know, I'm not taking any huge risks. It's, it's always a risk. But I'm just out there flowing and feeling, feeling, feeling good. That is a little bit risky. You know, yeah. physically risky, but it's worth it to me though yeah. for the the um, mental yeah. getaway from everything. You know, you know. I'm, so I'm glad I can still it, do it, and I, I can tell the folks at home that are listening and not viewing you. You know, you're super fit, fitness model, body, and that's hard earned. At the gym, I see you at the gym training, uh, not only intensely, but very, very. Uh, wisely and you know I, that's one of the things i asked you early on i saw you doing the um, exercises plyometrics and things that are really the domain of the professional athlete not the bodybuilder or general general fitness enthusiast and that's what caught my attention so so great so your primary role in life these days you know a uh, vocation is an actor but you've got your physical fitness, which is always going to be a part of your life, but like it is mine. And then, so you add that, add to that, the, um, you know, that, that sort of uh, intersection of something physical and cerebral, which is, which is BMX, I don't know what you call it, freestyle riding in a, in a, in a, in a yeah, I, I, my career was in racing. Racing different than... And then there, you just have, you know, like free riding, which free. Is skate park, street riding, okay. just dirt jumping, just n nothing really competitive, just going out and, 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 and creating. Yeah. And then create. So, there, that, creating. Yeah. so that, that, that allows you to access the creative part of your brain and sort of and tether it to the physical part because you're still getting a workout, right? Oh, yeah. In, in oh, skate yeah. Park. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a rude awakening the other day. I was, <laughs> could barely get out of bed the next day because I hadn't ridden that much. I, I, lo I love it. I love, I love that. And I think, I think a lot of um, our, a lot of jocks like me, old jocks like me could learn from that. You know, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe I need to learn a new trick, you know, something. Hey, pick yeah. up a sport. I don't think it's going to be a BMX bike, but surfing, 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 and then uh, and then for the uh, and I know there's a lot of folks on uh, that see it the other way. They're very artistic, especially like my friends that have gone through um, and studied uh, theater or musical theater. Maybe went to college and went down that that route, and then they often lose. And it's understandable. They get so you know sort of myopically focused on. That, that part of their brain and their training that they forget about the physical part and and so you're able to strike a balance and yeah commend it on that yeah i think that's important for everybody you know if the physical goes you know what do you got you know what i mean and the mental as well so i think it's i mean it's about the yin and the yang it's you know, not to get too woo woo but it's about being balanced in life balance a question i like to ask my professional actor friends and sometimes uh you never know what kind of how the, the the answer might you know sort of turn out, but there there's a uh, sort of a threshold to becoming. So, what's the difference between an actor and a professional actor? Well, if you're in New York City, and that would that would probably be uh, equity. Being an equity actor means you're a professional actor on the stage. But here in Hollywood, that is getting a SAG card, which which means that you are officially a member of the Screen Actors Guild, which is quite a threshold because you can't just say hey i'm here in hollywood i want to be on tv so where's my how do i you know where's my sag card bucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a it's a big deal it's a catch 22 because to get to become a professional actor and get your sag card you have to do something professionally and the people that are casting the professional actors into into productions only want to see professional actors. Right. Amateurs aren't allowed to get to audition for that. How did you get your SAG card? I got SAG eligible back in Cincinnati. I did a commercial. Actually, I was a football player for a Prilosec commercial. Nice. Nice. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So that got me eligible, but um, then I moved out. I mean, that was you know kind of a part, it's still part-time. 
back there, but moved out here for the weather to train for racing and then did some of the acting while I was here. Stayed eligible. I didn't join until I had to because there's a lot of non-union stuff that I was able to do. Did a Lexus commercial and that's what put me over the edge and I had to join. And I think that's a great story. I don't know how many of, of the membership, which I, I forget there's something like 200,000 people that are in the Screen Actors Guild or something like no at idea. any given time. And it's not a lot. And, uh, and how many of them earned their SAG card in Cincinnati? I don't know. Did George Clooney? He's a Cincinnati. Yeah, he's, he's probably uh, the biggest star to ever come out of Cincinnati. Yeah, he's northern Kentucky. Yeah, he's right in the right in the area. His dad was uh, Nick Clooney, who was our news anchor. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So yeah, they're so there. There's uh, so there's for those folks listening who are interested in getting into acting all around the Midwest and all over. You don't you don't have to be in L.A. or New York to get your SAG card. Not these days. I you mean, know. there's a lot of work in, in the South, you know, a but lot you, of TV shows. But you were hustling, right? You were in oh, the hustle. You were taking yeah. class, acting class, and you had an agent, right? So you were hustling that way? Yeah, I mean, I had to hustle to get an agent, um, and it, it's it's a hustle every day, I think, for everybody, you know? Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you know, and I enjoy the hustle. I enjoy the work. I'm used to it, you know, being a professional athlete and competing. You're competing every day with yourself, with other people. You know, to to get to make ends meet, you know, or to buy a new car or a new house, you know. So it's 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 a hustle. I enjoy the hustle. It gets me up in the morning, and and, and I enjoy it. Talk about the yeah. uh, the speed at which acting happens for you, where like your peers are out there doing things. I mean, if Benicio walks in the room, of course you're going to be able to do your part, but you guys are going to flow together. And yeah. it sounds like you work a lot on flow. So how does that feel for you when you're in there with somebody who maybe? You know, it's like Benicio, where you're like, wow, that guy really knows what he's doing. Like, you you know what elite peer-to-peer -peer competition is. Does that translate at all to acting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, I did a couple films back-to-back -back last month, which was gnarly. Um, a lot of work, but great. And in a couple of those films, worked with some really, really good people. And it was just like, as long as you're prepared and you just get in there and you lock horns with a man and it's just... I feel so real like this is really happening to me yeah um and you know you finish the scene and you're kind of like i don't know what just happened you know what i mean you're just really in it it's it's a it's an awesome feeling and i'm kind of chasing that okay and i want that and i think you know you feed off of you know you do your own thing in a scene you can't control the other actor but when you're locked in and you're connecting quote unquote it's a pretty powerful thing and uh, i want more yeah. Yeah. What was the first role that you landed in Hollywood? Was it, be it uh, on a theatrical side of the equation, be it uh, a film or television that uh, where you felt like, hey, I'm, I'm really, I'm really got a scene here. I'm really creating something. Um, I got, let's see, it was a movie. It was a feature. And it didn't pay anything, but I wasn't looking to get paid. I was just looking for experience, just to, you know, figure it all out. And it, it was pretty, it was pretty crazy because it was, you know, probably about 110 pages, and I was in 80 of them. Um, and it was great. It was an experience, and just kind of figuring it out as I went along. But it was good. I mean, it was a good, it was so a great experience. You kind of yeah. came right out of the gate, and you had a leading role in yeah. a film. Yeah, that's unusual. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was good. It was good. I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, as you see, I don't have a whole lot of words to you know for it. But um, I was happy with what I did at that time. I feel like I did the best I could, and it it was decent. But I learned a lot. You've got you you talked um, and you and I have talked uh, about this sort of before we got this interview going uh, when we were chatting a couple of weeks ago about. You were in a unique position, enviable unique position of working on two films at the same time, overlapping schedules. And first of all, it's, it, it happens so very rarely because it would take almost an act of God for the scheduling to line up just right where you could accommodate uh, both projects. What was, and I presumably uh, two very different types of characters. So tell us a little bit about what that experience was like and, and what, it, you know, what was the take home from that in terms of adding to your, you know, your experience as, as, an, as a professional actor. Yeah, I guess the take-home would be, 
be prepared for anything because you don't know what's going to happen but you can guarantee you can be guaranteed that something that you don't expect is going is going to happen what what would be an for example for sure um for an example so so one of the films I did, um, I booked, you know, two weeks before, maybe three weeks before we started shooting. There was no rush, no nothing like that. The other one was basically with a production company that I worked for probably four other times. And they needed, you know, a guy like me for this role. So they like, called me on a Sunday. Hey, Matt, are you available? We need to put you, you know, put yourself on tape, send it in in a couple hours. Okay, did it, send it in. About an hour after I sent the tape in, I, I booked the role. It's like, okay, when are we shooting? Uh, we shoot tomorrow haven't read the script or anything like that so they sent me the script so basically just just on the fly and i didn't know you know i didn't read i didn't hadn't read the script before we before i agreed to do it i just wanted to get the reps and you know get the you know do the movie great people to work with again and that was uh it was overwhelming because i had a much much bigger part than i thought so it's basically you know learning all the lines and, and not only just that but like who, you know who this guy is and and all this all the work that goes into it but i mean you know you're working on a budget and time and schedules get flipped we're not going to do this scene that was scheduled three days from now we got to do it today wow okay so you were going to shoot it later on in the afternoon so you've got you know while you're shooting these scenes that were scheduled today you got to learn your lines and, and figure out what's going on for that scene that was supposed to be shot later in the week this afternoon. Yeah. So, I mean, it was like pretty, uh, it was pretty stressful and I didn't anticipate that. And I don't know if I was in that situation, if I would do it, if I would have known it was going to be like that. I don't know if I would have done it, but I'm glad I did it because I grew so much from that, yeah. so much from that experience. And that's another thing that a good takeaway is you, you can guarantee that you're going to be put through something that you don't expect, but you'll get through it. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Through something that you don't expect, but you'll get through it, you know? You'll and get through it and somehow. At the, and at the end of, I can only imagine that at the end of the day, you might have literally come home from working all day playing one character, sat down to relax at home, and then it was necessary that you pick up your script for a totally different project and character for the next day. Yeah. And begin, uh, I don't know how far you were into that process, but you had to find a way, to, I, I, I presume, to flip a switch and, and begin, uh, you know, earnestly, um, whatever your particular process is to learn the material. Like, I don't want to say, I'm careful not to say to people, uh, we had to memorize those lines because, uh, for, you know, for example, Again, just Benicio del Toro is not familiar with memorizing lines. He's, it's not in his, he's, that sentence won't come out of his mouth. Right. He learns, learns the role. The, learn. Learns the material. He learns, yeah, he learns. And he, and he uh, it's never about memorizing. It's always about learning and, uh, and absorbing and, and, and figuring things out and questioning what those words mean. Without any particular emphasis to memorize that sentence, but understanding the truth of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. But that, the words do have to come out of your mouth in a certain do. sequence. And that's the thing. Like, yeah, that's great if you have the luxury of time yeah. to do that. You know, I'm sure Benicio gets whatever time he wants and he deserves it. You know what I mean? But a lot of the times, if you're in the grind, you don't have time. You don't have time for that. So it's just, it's, it's it's raw and it's dirty it's like okay the camera's on the red lights blinking say these lines that somebody else wrote for you and let's move on got it you know what i mean and make us believe it you only got one shot maybe two maybe two mm. takes and we got to move on because time is money you don't have you know matt as the actor doesn't have the power to to go off in the corner and get to where i need to be in my head you know what i mean you get the reality is no we got to move on 
you know, time is money. So do whatever you got to do quickly so we can get the heck out of here. You know, and that, that's kind of what I went through a little bit with, with one of the films was it was everything was happening so quickly that it's like, okay, I just need, I need to know these lines and then and, and get them out the best I can with, the, you know, being a character and all that. But that's the reality. Like these soap guys, man, I don't know how they do it. Yeah. I don't know how <laughs> they do it. Thinking about this. You, yeah. Pete, you did. You, he was on a soap. I did a few. Did a few. I did a few episodes of yeah. a soap, but I never had Gosh. big chunks of dialogue. But, but Pete Turner and I uh, had the great pleasure about a month and a half ago yeah. to, uh, to on the Break It Down show, we had our guest was uh, Lorenzo Lamas. Yeah. Oh, nice. A friend of mine from yeah. uh, Renegade. Heck and yeah. uh, he's fantastic. And he said that of all the things he's done, he's got the most. I mean, Lorenzo Lamas has the most has to have the most diversified oh resume oh, yeah. in the history of Hollywood. He's just done it all, yeah. Inclu including a musical and a yeah. one man show. I mean, he's done it Renaissance all. man. Yeah, and and of all the things that he's done, he makes a special point to, in a sense, praise the actors of. The daytime, because I actually didn't hadn't re remembered this, but he spent two years yeah. on daytime, and he said he spent those two years. He w when he wasn't working, he had sides folded up in his back pocket, and wherever he went, he was tr <laughs> never stopped trying to learn his lines. Oh my gosh, yeah. He said it was absolutely it, it dominated his yeah. life. His marriage, he's got children, he's trying to have a normal life outside of, the, you know, when he gets home off the set. And he said it <laughs> all just simply dominated his life. So the ones that um, the actors that really are able to do that with, with the e economy, uh, it's a, they have a, an amazing uh, a device going on in their head. Their, their ability yeah. to memorize a lot of lines. And, 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 and to your point, it's, it's beyond, again, it's beyond memorizing, it's to, to elicit a performance level day in day out he said is absolutely uh mind-boggling and yeah. also bren foster said the same thing because bren foster he he was on a soap opera but over a hundred different uh, episodes and he said because i asked because i wanted to check and he's like oh no like that's as hard as it gets you know because you have to have a level <laughs> and it's like just it just churn right i have so much respect for those guys I, i've never done a soap but i mean based off of just the films that i've done where it was kind of in that vein of the speed yeah terrifies me you know you're waking up in the middle of the night like you wake up to use the restroom or something you like you're you just you're, you're still saying your lines in your head you know you're just constantly i had a friend who did a couple years on a soap and he said he he had diarrhea every day he was just he was <laughs> losing he stressed was, out he was losing his hair yeah. he was just so stressed out he's like it was great i made a you know, decent money. I made, mean, you know, really good living for a while. But he's like, I'll never do it again. I just, I don't, it's, you know, it probably took five years off my life. Wow. You know, but, um, see, there's such a common so much respect, yeah. so much respect right there. for those guys. Man. Yeah. But I think oh. that goes also to like, you guys are elite performers, you know, the guy who plays D end and he gets to that point where he's like, I, I just, it's so much, even if I wanted to do it, I don't even enjoy it anymore, you know? And, and your peers are like, I just, I mean, you're in your 40s still riding your bike. Maybe not competitively, but, you know, you're out there still doing it. And there's guys that are like, I burned out when I was 22. You yeah. Know? And that's another thing I'm fortunate about was I got into this industry kind of late, late in life mm. to where I'm still all giddy. You know, I've been, in, been doing it about, you know, 10 years or so. And I still feel full of life. I'm not jaded by anything. You know, I see a lot of people who are just kind of, they got a bad attitude with it. You know, things didn't go their way or they thought that they'd be a star overnight or, or whatever. And they're kind of burned out, but it's like they don't have, they don't want to do anything else. They don't know what else to do. So they're just kind of going through the motions, which is really sad to see. But, you know, I, I get it. You know, I, I see where they're coming from, but it's, um, I'm glad that I'm not in that position. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So I'm very, I'm fortunate that I got into it later in life. Well, you are in a spot now where you've got a couple of projects in the can and you've got at least a couple of projects I want to talk about that people are, apt to to see on in a rerun at this point evil nanny yeah my daughter's my ransom da my daughter's ransom yeah 
Yeah, tell us about those. Um, yeah, and so where can people, where, where, where they spot these them? Are, these are on Lifetime, Lifetime Movie Network, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, My Daughter's Ransom was good. We shot that like last year and they run it, you know, a couple times a week. So it's, you know, it's good. Excellent. And actually it was cool because I booked the, I booked the movie with, with an, a buddy of mine. We didn't know. So he played the bad guy who kidnaps my daughter. Nice. So it was really cool. We had one scene together, and it was the very end scene, like the death scene, where I, I hit him in the face. Well, I don't want to ruin it, but, yeah. <laughs> but we get in a fight. Right. And um, so we, we worked together for one day on it, um, but it was really, you know, such a small world, you know. Good um, fun there, huh? Yeah, it was great. It was great. So, yeah, we did that. And uh, Evil Nanny is another one that we shot a couple years ago. Still, they're still running it. Um, for nothing else, Evil Nanny has to get a certain recognition for one of the greatest sure. titles of a film I've heard. In it's it's actually it's ever. a pretty good story, man. It's um, this I, my wife and I hire a nanny, and our nanny, you know, she's crazy. She establishes residency at our house, and she won't leave. So it's loosely based on um, you know different actual events that have happened. High jinks ensue. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, it, it's fun. It's it was fun and. Uh, you know, it's not a bad story. We're, we're talking to Matt Polkamp. Follow him on Instagram. Just write Matt Polkamp and you find him. It looks like he's uh, taking a bathtub uh, full of oatmeal and <laughs> detoxifying in one of the pictures. <laughs> what about, I mean, as you're looking forward in your career, you know, you're going to want to evolve at some point. I can already tell that about you. Will you get into writing? Will you get into directing? Or um, what do you see for yourself? I don't know. Um, I never really thought. Um, about directing, really, but I find myself kind of like if I help other, you know, friends with auditions and stuff. I kind of find myself yeah. offering up if if it's welcomed, you know, yeah. which is kind of fun. So, and then writing. I mean, I think that I have, you know, everybody has a story to tell, sure. And I think that that I have one as well. So who knows? I mean, I definitely write here and there, very informally. Um, so who knows? You know, who knows what tomorrow holds. You got a couple other films in the can. That's a good feeling to be able to sit here and say, I got stuff done. It's just waiting to, to, to drop. Can you can you talk to us about what uh, we can look forward to seeing you in the second half of 2019? Yeah, uh, just finished. May was a busy month for me, as we kind of talked about. One of the movies is called Gaslit, and I play a really bad guy in that one. And then the other one is called uh, Nightmare Doctor, which I play a really good guy in that one. So and those will both be uh, on Lifetime. Um, not exactly sure when. I think they're doing N- post-production right now. Nightmare Doctor m- might give Evil Nanny <laughs> a run for its money. <laughs> I'm thinking Absolutely. so. Yeah, yeah, neck neck. yeah, yeah. Ah, they'll go head to head. We'll see. Maybe we'll have a, a, po- uh, a, a viewer's poll. You know? <laughs> we'll see which one takes the prize. <laughs> Uh, but so, it, it, it was fun. It was fun. Great, 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 great people I worked with. Met some wonderful people on both of them. What's more uh, interesting? Uh, play good guy or bad guy? I kind of like the bad guy, you know, because I feel like in my nature, I'm a good guy. Um, but it's nice to get that bad guy out. We all got a little bit in us, you know. It's just, um, you know, out, out here in the world, we, you know, we're a group person. We, we censor, you know, we're all acting out there. You know, right now we're acting, we're, you know, we're behaving. We're not causing a ruckus. We're not doing what we... Anymore. You know, yeah, right. So <laughs> it's, um, you know, we're well behaved. Um, so we act all day long. Yeah. But it's nice to have the permission, give yourself the permission to trust, you know, a little bit of evil that you got in you because we all got it di- to different degrees. But uh, it's fun. It's fun to let that out. That's like therapy almost, you know. Dead. Do you have certain tools you'll see other actors use? But like, oh man, I wish I either I wish I had that, or I'm going to use that. There are things you see. As far as um, you like, know, like whatever, like uh, let's say you watch, you know, he go crazy. And you're like, look at how he does rage. I love that, you know, or something that you like see someone else do, and uh, either you wish you had it or you want to try to use yeah. that skill. I mean, everybody's got their own process with things. Some people, you know, have different methods and all of that. I I just. I, I, can I jump in and yeah. answer this yeah, question? I like good, this question, yeah. and I just happen to, to be uh, thinking about this. And here's the thing that I have, and I'm not the only guy, but I think I've caught uh, Brad Pitt, who I really like as an actor. I think the fact, oh, my God, he's such a beautiful man. Well, I think it overshadows the fact he's a really fine actor. And he, But here's the thing. I don't want to call it a crutch, but I'm going to say it's a crutch, that he 
will use this tactic a lot in movies. Ooh, Watch for okay. this. Ready? I know yeah. what you're going to say. He's eating. Yeah, yeah, he does it all the time. <laughs> My God, he's eating all the time. How can anybody eat so much while they're acting? Yeah. yeah. Does anybody eat more while they're acting? I don't Brad think Pitt? so. But he, he's got, you know, he looks like he's in shape. So whatever he's eating, he's, uh, you know, he's still right. But in one of the Oceans movies. <sighs> yeah. He, uh, you know, they, 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 yeah. But he, yeah, if, you, if you watch, he's eating like shrimp cocktail in <laughs> uh-huh. one. And in the same scene, you know, different over the shoulder. He's eating like, uh, you know, something else, you know, so the, the food is switching within the scene. And I don't know if that was done intentionally just to mess with people or they just didn't catch it. That's a director's but, cut where they talk about that. And I don't, know about, I don't think they reveal that, but they talk about the whole him eating thing. You know? yeah, yeah. And then also naming, but, naming cons, you know, like just getting silly with that and just riffing and coming yeah. up with these funny but, con names. Well, you know, I have to admit that I, I did ask Benicio, I did mention this to him and asked his opinion. And he, they worked together in uh, oh, yeah. Snatch. Right. Yeah, that's a great movie. And, and he, he speaks very highly of, of him. And he says, um, he says, yeah, I've noticed it too. And I'm a hun- and this Benicio is saying, and he goes, I'm completely fine with it because it's organic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Take, take, He's hungry. Take, take gonna eat. You what a, you will you from a- that. Yeah, you have an itch on your face, scratch it, you know? Yeah. Just make it real. But it's funny because my brothers actually went to college with Brad Pitt, University oh, of Missouri. Missouri. Yeah, yeah. My brother, Mike, um, who passed away, but uh, he was a naval pilot. He was in, uh, you know, the Men of Mizzou calendar, right? <laughs> uh, and yeah. Brad Pitt was like the producer of the calendar. So was, there's, there's a picture. He wasn't on, in it. He was the producer No, he was like it? the producer of it. And the picture of him on the back, you know, it, it's so funny because he's so he's got like his collar popped, and you know, but it's funny seeing that, you know, back when he was, you know, twenty years old or something oh. like that before he moved to Hollywood. That's a great but, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Men of Mizzou, and, yeah. and he, you know what? But he was producing it. He was hustling it, right? He yeah. was making yeah, money. Let me, let me, yeah. let me grab my bros, my good-looking bros, yeah. and snap a picture of him. We'll make, we'll make yeah, some money. Make a- Make a calendar of some yeah. hot dudes. Yeah. Great story. It's hilarious. I can't remember what year that was, but it was, you yeah. know. So your brother's the same age as Brad Pitt? Yeah, actually, I have uh, two. They're twins, Mark and Mike. Mike, uh, Mike passed away in 92. He was a naval pilot. And um, and Mark, his twin brother, which they look nothing alike. Oh. <laughs> I look more like Mike than his twin does, you know. But yeah, they, they went to college. Uh, I think Cheryl, Cheryl Crow was actually... In that graduating, or not, really? yeah, Same in that year time. as well, yeah, yeah. That's funny. Wow, who would kind of funny? Go to Mizzou and end up, you know, leading Hollywood rock yeah. star and actor. And this, would, like within, I think it was the same year, like the same age. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. That's that's some some heat, some heat in that yeah. class, you know. Man, I appreciate you coming hanging out. With by the way, we're at Q's Pete's Q's. place. This place is great. Yeah, I love it here. It's cool to have you come out and share the story with us. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's yeah. nice to meet you, and Pete, thanks for having me. You know, Cold both you guys. Camp. I want to point out uh, P-O-H-L. Yeah. German. K-A-M-P. I could imagine 20 different ways to spell that name, but I just wanted the folks to find you on Instagram. And, and I've seen about 30 different ways to, <laughs> to spell it and pronounce it, too. Ugh. Where does one ride their bike like on a dirt track like BMX style? Um, actually, in Southern California, where we're at right now, um, there Bellflower. Okay. So east a little bit. Yeah. There's a track out there which is great. People are dynamite. Yeah. And then I think there's a track up in Simi Valley. I haven't been to that one in, in years, but Bellflower is the one that I went to regularly. Um, and then in Orange County, there's I mean there, there's a bunch too. Yeah. Um, Whittier, there's a nice park. And these are, you know, BMX, is, it's a family sport. Yeah. You know, you have you have little Joey and little Susie riding, and then mom yeah. and dad are riding, too. It's a family thing. It's, it's, it's such a, you know, a great, a great family sport, and I'm so glad that I found it. Because I wasn't supposed to find it. There was yeah. no reason for me to find the sport yeah. growing up, and I did. I mean, it was cool, but it was inaccessible when I was a kid. You know, Where are you like, from, Pete? California, the okay. northern part, but, you know, like, you know, Haro bikes and yeah. put a number on your BMX bike. But, like, it wasn't... There wasn't a path to like, like, maybe you read the magazine and you're like, look at those guys, but they're only a, a little older than you. It just wasn't like a, a way to jump over and get into it. Yeah. And I mean, that's the thing I think with, with a lot of sports and everything these days, I mean, no, nobody's retiring, yeah. you know, like the average age of a BMX racing professional is, you know, probably five or seven years 
older than it, it was in the you know yeah. late 80s or whatever. And I, I think just in every every sport, really, people are just taking better care of themselves. People are learning how to train correctly, and they're just more fit, you know, in general in life, for sure. Thank you.